Welcome to the seminar series on sewer and pipeline engineering. My name is Bert Bossela. I am the scientific director of the IKT Institute for Underground Infrastructure. In this session, we are looking at the open cut method and special soil and components. And this time it's about flexible pipes. And usually these are plastic pipes. So when do we call a pipe a flexible pipe? In the static calculations, a basic distinction is made between two kinds of pipes or pipe salt systems. First, there are rigid pipes, as shown in the picture above. Here, most loads go into the pipe. The soil next to the pipe is softer than the pipe and takes considerably less load. Typical examples for these pipes are concrete and clay pipes. And then the second case, these are flexible pipes, like in the picture below. Here, the soil next to the pipe absorbs more load than the pipe itself. In addition, the pipe deforms horizontally into the lateral bedding. This activates further lateral bedding reaction forces that are far greater than the normal horizontal earth pressure. It is important to know that this consideration has basically nothing to do with plastic as a material. Here it is only a matter of the relationship between the pipe stiffness and the soil stiffness. So it is the deformability of the pipe compared to the soil that counts. In this sense, thin-walled steel pipes in stiff soils can also have a flexible behavior. The most interesting aspect in the structural calculation of flexible pipes is the proof of deformation. Because the pipes may deform up to a maximum diameter change of for example 4 to 6%. It is assumed that up to this deformation, there won't be any major problems for stability, for tightness or for operational safety. So why does that make sense? Well, 6% deformation, then the pipes are still relatively round as assumed in the statics. And most plastic pipe joints will still remain tight under this deformation. And the cross-section is hardly reduced at all, so that the medium can still flow through the pipe easily. We should keep in mind, however, that the deformation model is based on an elliptical deformation pattern. We can see this in the picture in the bottom right-hand corner. So keep in mind, deformation is okay as long as it looks like on this slide and as long as it does not exceed 4 to 6% of the diameter. So far, so good, but then what do we do with such an image? Are such deformations still acceptable? At this point, we can already say no, that is not acceptable. This is neither an ellipse, nor are the deformations below 6% of the diameter. Something must have gone thoroughly wrong here. Maybe high point loads on the pipe combined with installation errors. All this is very likely here. So we see that it is important to regularly inspect flexible pipe systems from the inside. Here we see a deformation measurement on the large pipe cross section. The vertical and horizontal diameter is measured with a measuring rod. In smaller pipes, caliper gauges are used to measure the diameter in vertical and horizontal direction. Here we see the results of a diameter measurement for a 120 meter long sewer section. According to the records, the nominal diameter was 1800 millimeters. The black line connects the measured values for the vertical diameter, the red line the measured values for the horizontal diameter. If we put the mean value of all measured values as a green line in this diagram, we see that the mean value is clearly below the nominal value. Obviously, the mean inner diameter of the pipe is slightly smaller than the nominal diameter. This is not a bad thing, you just have to know it. Because the limit values of the deformation are now to be referred to the mean diameter, maximum 6%, we have said. In this example, the maximum values for the horizontal and vertical deformation are very well within this 6% range. So basically we can assume that the pipe has been installed according to the design. 
Why do I say basically? Well, this assessment assumes that the pipe is really deformed as a symmetrical ellipse, as we imagined it in the design. This means that we should also have checked this on the basis of a visual inspection. Otherwise, misinterpretation can occur. And I would like to show you this with an example. Here we see a typical deformation figure that we have recorded with a laser in a smaller pipe. This deformation is already a bit larger than the allowed 6%. We would see this immediately in a vertical and horizontal measurement. In the same pipeline, we also recognize this deformation figure. Here, the ellipse is diagonal, rotated by 45 degrees. Obviously, there were strong differences in compaction and bedding pressure during installation, and this has deformed the pipe in a completely different way than assumed in the structural model. Now, the problem is, if we only look at the vertical and horizontal diameter here, we measure the original diameter value. That means no deformation at all. Only by looking at the picture of this rotated ellipse, we realize that something has definitely gone wrong here. Looking at it from a mathematical perspective, there is a myriad of conceivable deformation figures. Usually these can be represented by a superposition of typical waveforms of a Fourier series. However, not all conceivable deformation figures are also relevant in practice. Therefore, on this picture, I illustrated deformation shapes that can be observed in practice of sewer and pipeline construction, be it alone or in combination. In the example above, we see on the left side the classical elliptical deformation, precisely as assumed in design. It is called two-wave deformation because of two maxima, one in the crown and one in the invert. On the right side, we see a four-wave deformation mostly caused by extreme compaction of the side fill. Both cases can be described very well by measuring the vertical diameter change. The situation is different in the examples below. On the left we see the case already explained, an oblique ellipse which shows no deformation in vertical and horizontal direction, but maximum values at 45 degrees. On the right there is another particularly interesting case. Such a three-wave deformation can occur, for example, if the lateral support area is very well compacted and the vertical load is high. The surprising thing is that no matter at what angle we determine the diameter, we will always measure the original diameter. The reason for this is simple. The deformations on the opposite sides are in opposite directions. So they compensate each other if we only measure the diameter. In such a case, we need a laser measurement from a central fixed point in order to be, to be able to record the radius and so the actual deformation. In practice, all these effects can then be superimposed. Here we see a slightly deformed cross-section where a two-wave elliptical deformation is superimposed with a three-wave deformation. By means of a Fourier series analysis, both parts can be determined. The maximum values are shown here, 2.1% for the elliptical portion and 3.4% for the three-wave portion. With a simple diameter measurement, we would only detect the 2.1%. Now, of course, I do not want to demand that in the future all plastic pipes be measured with laser and the results subjected to a Fourier series analysis. For practice, one should only keep in mind the best information about deformations in plastic pipes is the optical or TV inspection. There, it is very easy to see how badly the pipe is deformed, especially at the pipe joints. If then we detect, detect peculiar shapes, we have to decide whether or not this still corresponds to the assumptions of design. So we have to ask, is the pipe deformed to an ellipse and does the whole thing look as expected? Deformation measurements then only serve as a supplementary information that must be interpreted correctly. However, deformations can also have other effects, especially on connections. Not all connection systems react robustly when the main sewer pipe deforms. Here we see an example from our tests. 
If the large pipe deforms, then in areas with large changes in curvature, the connections can also be strongly deformed and strained. This, of course, can become a problem for the tightness of the connections. So connections must be designed for such deformations and strains. But it is not only about the pipe geometry. Plastics can also creep, and this is often represented in the static calculation by calculating with a long-term and a short-term modulus of elasticity. But what does that actually mean? Is the modulus of elasticity then time-dependent? It sounds as if a new pipe is stiffer under load than an older pipe, but that is not really the case. It is about something else. The modulus of elasticity does not change over time. The mathematical correction only serves to take creep effects into account in the statics. Here we see a picture from a so-called creep test. The pipe, here for example a plastic liner with 1200 mm diameter, is under constant vertical load. With a purely elastic material, the deformation would then also be constant. However, this is not the case with plastic. The pipe deforms slowly but continuously in the vertical direction. And what does this have to do with the calculated modulus of elasticity? Well, let me explain this step by step. On the right, we see the course of deformation over time. Right at the beginning, there is an elastic initial deformation. Then the deformation increases linearly on a logarithmic scale. We can still measure the first four values. The last value we estimate as an extrapolation of the straight line. For example, as the deformation after 50 years of load. The modulus of elasticity is defined as stress divided by strain. Here we get the short-term modulus by dividing the stress by the short-term strain at the start of the test. The long-term modulus after 50 years is then obtained by dividing the same stress by the strain value after 50 years. With this parameter, we can then use the same formulas as for a purely elastic material and prove that the liner is still stable over 50 years under constant load. Of course, the stiffness of the liner has not changed. If it were subjected to a short-term load, again after 50 years, it would still respond with the same short-term strain. If the material behavior were to actually change, it would be aging, and that is the decomposition under environmental influences. Here, however, the long-term modulus of elasticity is about creep behavior and not about aging. So, let me summarize some conclusions on the subject of plastic pipes. The vertical deformation is an important design parameter. However, in pipe design, important assumptions are made about the deformation shape of the pipe. The whole thing should be vertically symmetric and elliptical. However, in case of construction errors, the actual deformations may deviate from these assumptions. This concerns the extent of the deformation as well as the deformation shape. Using Fourier series and analysis, complex deformation figures can be described, but of course this is very time-consuming in practice. In practice, a combination of optical inspection and measurement seems to be more appropriate. If we already see a suspicious deformation shape or size during inspection, then measurements can help to confirm and quantify the problem. However, we have seen that the design value for maximum vertical deformation may not be meaningful enough to evaluate real deformation in practice. In addition, we should always pay attention to the flexibility of pipe joints and connections. These elements must be leak tight, especially when the pipe is deformed as expected in design. And finally, plastics creep over time. That means they deform continuously under constant load. This must be taken into account in the structural calculation, but has nothing to do with aging. Thank you.